So hello and welcome to the first ever testing Ask Me Anything. Now, this is a place where you get to ask the questions and you get to ask those questions to some incredible people in the testing community. So I'm your host for today, Simon Tomes. It's great to meet you all there and thank you so much for joining in and uh, yeah, getting stuck in with the first ever testing Ask Me Anything. So, so this is an experiment. We've never done this before. Uh, we want to see what happens. We want to see what, um, yeah, what value you get from this and, and we'll go from there. So, so my goal uh, today is to ask a variety of the questions that you've shared. Um, you can sit back and listen and learn, uh, although I do encourage you to, to really actively listen because I guarantee there will be some incredible things shared today. So if you have any questions, please just go to the ask a question section and stick them there. Just, just throw your question down. Uh, you'll notice that there is a voting uh, feature. So if there's a, a question that you feel is really important, then, then please upvote it and that will help guide the questions that I ask. Um, and it's incredibly cool to have so many people join us today. Uh, it is all recorded. So if you miss some stuff, don't worry, you can come back to this recording a little bit later. So enough of my yakking, let's, let's boogie. And today's guest is Richard Bradshaw. Now, Richard is a, an absolute legend amongst the testing community. He is doing and has done so much good stuff for, for the whole of the global testing community. Um, and it, it's really, I guess, quite difficult to know where to start uh, with all the good stuff that he's doing. So, so I think, I think we should just get stuck in. So I encourage you to take out your notebooks, digital or otherwise, and let's get started. Um, so Richard, how are you doing? Hey, hello, Simon. I'm doing good. A bit terrified, to be honest, but um, <laughs> it's one of those, got that feeling of, why did you think of this? Uh, this would be a good idea, <laughs> but hopefully it will be. Absolutely. I think it's a, an awesome initiative and, and a great opportunity for, for people across the globe to, to learn from some people who uh, are just fantastic and, and really understand their craft and have lots of things to share. So, so you can, the, the audience, you can literally ask anything. Um, we have kind of branded this, I guess, is, is on the topic of automation, but, but don't let that stop you from, from uh, asking questions that aren't automation related. So let's, uh, let's dive in and jump on the first question. Okay, let's go so, for it. Let's do it. So this is a question uh, from Lise, and it is, how would you implement test automation for the first time in a company? What questions would you ask to make the choice of which language and, language and framework to use? And uh, there's a little extra note, please make up a fictional company website or web app <laughs> with an example stack to answer this question in detail. Okay, well, see how you got on with the first part. Yeah, let's go with the first part. So the first part was where would we start? Um, well, when you, there's a lot of emphasis, like a lot of people try and start by just going ahead and trying to automate what they believe is the testing that's currently being done. So a common scenario is they have all these test cases or all these tests that they have to run all the time. So people dive in and automate them straight away. Um, the problem with that is we don't actually know if any of those tests are any good or even worth keeping in the first place just because they exist now doesn't mean it's something we should go and automate so for me my my preference is actually to start on mapping out how they currently are doing testing so we need to understand their current approach to testing and then work out the best place to put automation in um, and also for me in this example and it will become apparent throughout this webinar automation for me is far more than automating tests so my focus would be to fully model out exactly how they're currently testing and then work out where I think automation can help. So a, a quick win in a, well, not necessarily a quick win, but a good place to start in a lot of companies is creating the data because you're going to need that for your automated checks and you're also going to need it to do your testing. 
So if we can find out how we can do that, and I like to put that into a wider category of managing the state. So I want to be able to put my app into any state that I want in order for me to test from and then to run automation from. So that is one place that I really encourage people to start. Um, but as I said, it really is fully understanding their approach to testing, because if you come in with this big plan to do lots of automated checks, you're, you're, you're actually, um, you know, you're not going to align with the current approach. So you have to understand the current approach and then work out the best place to go. In terms of language, um, <laughs> to be honest, I always used to take the stance that you should go with whatever the stack's built in. Um, and there's advantages to this. One of them is um, you have a great resource for support because most of the developers in that context, they'll know how to write in the language. Because obviously, they're building a product in that language. So um, also around that tooling, such as things like build the pipelines might be written with, with a certain language in mind. Um, so my, some of the configuration tools that they use, such as Chef and Puppet, they may be all written in a specific language that it will help you with. But the end of the day is you're meant to be creating stuff that's going to be helping you do your job. So go with something you're comfortable with. And if you're more comfortable in Ruby and the whole development project is in Java, then go with Ruby, but be aware that that may mean additional work when it comes to running some of your automations, especially your automated checks if you're trying to add them to some kind of CI that's essentially probably been configured to be very Java heavy. Um, a made up scenario, uh, a mobile app, for, you know, think of a mobile app. If I'd moved to a company that's got a big mobile app, the first place I would start is deploying that mobile app to a device. Um, because that's something that I'm going to be wanting to do all day long. So I would automate the deploying of the app so that I can quickly get many versions on my phone and allow me to go from there. And then after the mobile app, most mobile apps are pretty stupid and dumb. They don't really do a lot. So all the logic's in the APIs. So I would probably then go and look at automating something on the API level uh, and work my way up over time. Yeah, and oh, well, the final one that's obviously fairly common as well is, you know, um, it's not just about the automation that I could do. It'd be the automation that the rest of the team could do as well. So putting a plan in place for perhaps some unit tests if there isn't any, um, some kind of integration level tests, and perhaps even pipeline deployments if they don't have them yet, CI, look at getting that implemented. You know, a big part of introducing automation into a company is, not necessarily having the technical skill set, it's having the mindset to know where and when to use it. Who implements it isn't that important um, as long as you've identified it's the right thing to do. So yeah, long, long question, but long answer as well. I'm just gonna have some tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take take a take a drink break there. That's that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And if there if there is anything uh, this evening or I should say today that that resonates, please do uh, tweet you know uh share share what it is that that richard is sharing sharing with us and, and get it out to others uh we're using the hashtag uh hashtag testing ama i'm just going to stick that on the uh on the chat so you can uh go and tweet uh what richard is sharing because i think it's important that others like others hear what richard has to say it's fantastic okay so let's dive into the next question um Okay, so we've got, got another one that's, that's got a, a good number of votes. Uh, this is from Dan. Thank you, Dan, for sharing your question. So the question is, Richard, do you suggest or dissuade testers in seeing automation as a prerequisite for success in their testing career? Why and how? Um, no, so I, I don't see automation as being a, a prerequisite for having a um, successful testing career. Um, I like to talk about it as just being one of the many tools that you can have in your tool belt. Uh, there is many others that are beneficial. Um, critical thinking is obviously incredibly valuable to a tester. Great communication skills, note taking, um, being able to visualize and model things is also um, a great tool set. Having said that, you know, it's not necessarily knowing how to write automation. It would be more 
an understanding of code these days because everything is very technical. The, the way we release and build software has become increasingly more, you know, there's lots of packages we use and CI. So, you know, being aware of that is important. But um, we've been having a few conversations with people recently. There is a large proportion of, let's say, automators, SEDETs, SETIs, I've heard them called, um, who probably lack basic testing knowledge, um, which is, in my view, highly problematic because they just know how to write automation, but they don't know why they're doing it, how to talk about it. Um, I don't want to repeat examples I've used in the past, but I, I put it on a blog recently about interviewing someone who I asked them if they knew about inheritance and encapsulation, and they said no but they said they would implement all the tests using page objects, which, you know, is it's hilarious in a way because that's exactly what they would be doing. Um, so if someone was new into their career, I, I probably would encourage them to explore automation, but I wouldn't say it's necessity. And also I am, I share this view with a lot of other people. Um, I think testing is going to be in more demand than ever. And I mean, proper exploratory deep testing because software is becoming so integrated so seamless it's absolutely everywhere and it's not slowing down it's actually getting quicker and the interfaces are changing um you know we're all happily been on the web and desktops but now we've got smartphones in our pockets we've got watches that do stuff our car can pretty much do everything our fridge and our kettles and our ovens are all going to have this technology um, and to be able to thoroughly test all that stuff is going to take good solid thinking testers uh, and right now this push down automation is leading to potentially a lot of people who have great coding skills but don't necessarily have the testing mindset so i would never discourage anyone um, i would encourage them and there's fantastic uses uses for it um, but at the same time there's a whole other arm to testing that doesn't require the ability to write code fantastic thank you for sharing that so let's uh, <laughs> let's move on to the next question um, Okay, so I, I'm going to jump to a question from Jasmine. Um, the question is, do you have any links or websites you suggest for helping to practice writing automation? Um, oof. So a guy called Dave Hefner wrote a very good website, um, which funny enough, he called the internet. Um, so you can go to the, the hyphen internet dot Heroku app dot com i think it is uh, and he's built lots of pages um specifically designed for the um, functionality of webdriver and um, so i know that exists uh, in terms of other things um not really there's a lot of websites people have built so there's a lot of good security websites that um people have built i know for example dan billing built one called ticket magpie and there's a lot of hacking ones out there that you can use to practice on uh, Mark Winteringham recently released his uh, RESTful Booker product on Heroku. So there's a set of APIs that you can practice against. Um, and Alan, I'll have to find, find the link, but Alan Richardson recently shared um, a website that had a load of public APIs on it um, that you can just f use free of charge and obviously just practice your skills against. Um, and yeah, that's probably, I wouldn't really know um, I can't really think of any place where, you know, he could get some extra help. But the other option is um, dive into the world of open source. Go and download the source code for some of the tools that you probably use. They're full of example tests. They're always crying out for help with tests um, at all levels, you know, on the actual functionality of the library, but also the code they've written themselves. That can be a fantastic place to learn about um, tests and how to implement them. Fantastic advice and um, <clears throat> conveniently thank, thank you to those posting in the chat room as well, uh, sharing some brilliant links. Um, so, okay, let's move on to another question. So there's a question here about tooling from Oli. Um, continuous delivery is a hot topic at our company at the moment. 
Are there any market leading automation tools that would assist the current test team transition from system testing into a continuous delivery world? Can you repeat it, Simon? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Processed half of it, but not all of it. Yep. So um, if, if you wanted to see it, it's the, the question from Ollie, uh, if you have a look at the ask a question tab, but, but I, let me share it again. Continuous delivery is a hot topic at our company. Uh, are there any market leading automation tools that would assist the current test team to transition from system testing into a continuous delivery world? Oh, market leading. Um... Well, the first thing, as Ollie says, you know, continuous delivery is is certainly a hot topic. Um, in terms of the tools I would exp encourage people to explore, I'm not entirely sure what they're categorized as, um, but stuff that's basically what you use to tie all your CI together. So things like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, learn in basic bash, the basic commands you can do in bash. If you're in Windows, um, Get, get on board with PowerShell and try and learn some of those um, because it's those little scripts that you write in such tools that the ones that really do um, give you a great boost and uh, allow you to do a lot of things. Um, you've also got obviously CI tool, you know, get into grips with things that plug into CI. So Jenkins has numerous plugins that make it easy to run, um, you know, tests that you've written in WebDriver or tests that you've written in Java or whatever programming language, to be honest, they all exist. Um, so that is a, an interesting place to start with. And then in the continuous delivery spaces, for me, there's an, a huge emphasis on, you know, testing in production and monitoring. So I would, again, encourage people to explore some of the monitoring tools that are out there, uh, as well as some of the analytic tools and see if you can integrate some of those into your process. Uh, but there isn't any really market leading tools and specifically not in the context that I've been working in. Uh, I'm very much an open source kind of person. So, you know, those really do depend on the language that you decide to implement a lot of this in. Um, but the other thing as well is, again, for that type of question, just get involved with the community. Obviously, you're on this, you're on this chat. So, you know, you are well aware of the stuff that's out there and just follow some of the tools people share. For my personal way of doing this is as soon as I see a tweet about a tool, I save it. And then at some point I will try and spend a few hours trying out some of these tools just to see what they do and make myself aware of them. But I don't really think there is any market leaders, but there certainly is popular ones. But again, back to continuous delivery in the future of my view of testing, start exploring outside of the automated check-in testing tools. Start looking at the build tools and the other things that you can automate as part of your work. Absolutely. And perhaps it's worth, um, so you kind of uh, delved into that topic. I think there was a question around um, your thoughts on, um, one second, I'm just finding it here. Yeah, just your thoughts uh, on automation in testing. Um, someone has asked, uh, don't forget to speak about the difference between automation in testing and test automation. And perhaps for some of the audience um, who, who aren't familiar with that concept, um, yeah, would you be willing to, to share just, uh, just perhaps a brief introduction about the difference between automation and testing and test automation? Yeah, sure. So it probably, I can't remember when it was, I did a podcast with um, Mark Tomlinson and we were coming up with a title for the podcast and basically the, the contents of this podcast were me talking about the tools that I've been building recently to help me do my job as a tester. Um, some of them were very simple things that basically packaged up some of my um, test artifacts, so screenshots, notes that I'd written, and they zipped them up and attached them to Jira. So it was a little noddy script. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't very complex to create. And then there was a few other tools I built around creating data and so forth. And we had this chat and then Mark went, okay, I'm going to call this um, a wide look at automation testing. And I was like, no, nah, it's not, it doesn't fit. And he's like, well, what do you want to call it? And I went, well, I'm using automation in the context of testing. Like, let's call it automation and testing. And ever since then, it's become a bit of a theme that I write and talk about. So I'm a huge advocate of the people who have the skills to write automated 
checks in, in my world um they have so much more programming know-how and ability to do other things than just write automated checks and tests um and they need to i encourage them strongly to start exploring how they can use those skills to help other people in their company do their jobs um and especially around testing so example i created a whole system that created test data yet the testers in my team were still there in sql writing commands to create data so i put a ui or I actually put an api on my data creation code and I sent it to them as a little UI that it was an awful UI, <laughs> but you could click create user and it would create them a user. And then they could go ahead and test and they didn't have to go into SQL anymore and start writing commands that are very easy to get wrong. And then after that, I ended up um, building a Slack bot that my product owner could use um, to create data himself. So he could just go on Slack and say, create me some data and it would create some data. So what I mean by automation and testing is just, you know, little tools, essentially. I consider automated checks and tests to be tools, but also start writing other tools to help you do your job. Like for me, like I said, I was uploading log files and notes and screenshots up to Jira. And I was doing them all manually one by one. And sure, it only took a few minutes, but when I automated it, it took like 10 seconds. And that's so much time that I get back. So this is encouraging people now just to, you know, don't be fixated in automated checks and try and get out of that scenario where you write checks all day and they fail and you fix them and then you write more and they fail. Try and create some tools that just help testers test. And that's what I mean by automation and testing. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And I guess um, it, it makes me think of uh, what you recently shared, some fantastic resources to kind of get get started uh, with programming, to be able to then start to create the tools that you just described. Um, so perhaps, yeah, we, we should grab those links and, and share them on the chat, because uh, from, uh, I've had a look and they are fantastic resources. So we will uh, make sure we get them out there so, so others can find them. Ah, thank you, Heather, for sharing that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's dive in with the next question. Okay. Okay, uh, a question from German Mama. Which non <laughs> German Mama. German Mama. <laughs> okay. So, uh, which non technical skills should a tester have and constantly train to be awesome at test automation? Uh, and in brackets, not only automation testing. So, non technical skills to have to help them with their automation? Yes. Awesome. That is a really good question. So, uh, I can, well, the first one that comes to mind is really important. It's uh, it's basically it's modeling. Um, if you if you think of an automated check holistically, it is one big model um, where you know you've got something coming in one end. You want to do lots of stuff to it, and you want it to come out at the other end. So um, modeling is crucial because if you don't have the ability to model, you're going to end up producing essentially a flaky incorrect automated check so the design up front which again is the modeling skill is really important and if if you can if you can nail that and get that right as i mentioned earlier it doesn't necessarily then matter who implements that automated check as long as you know that it's been designed in such a way um so that is certainly one and then a few other ones that probably seem pretty obvious but if you get into automation and testing quite heavily, you end up building lots of tools and you need to teach people how to use them. Um, so you need to be really, you know, you need to keep practicing being able to talk about automation. So a lot of people talk about how testers suck at talking about testing. Um, well, lo and behold, we also suck about talking about automation. So, um, you know, that is something to practice, being able to talk um, concisely about the things that you have automated why you've done it and, and going ahead down that route and, and yeah documentation again you know helping other people use your tools and um, so again it's same similar basis but if you're going to build lots of tools people you need to help people use them um, and 
and the other thing is obviously curiosity you know it's, it's kind of something that you can't really teach but um you know you need to be curious and keep looking out what tools are out there um, keep scanning the markets keep going on github go on twitter go on the forums and and see what other things are out there and you know just to as i said um for me, I call it being tool aware. I don't necessarily need to know the depths of that tool, but I'm aware that tool exists. So if I ever end up in a scenario where um, I can think back to the tools that I have on my list and pick one of them up and then see if it's suitable for the job I'm trying to do. Uh, but the most important one is emphasis, you know, is modeling. It's so important. You there? Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just uh, coming off mute there. I would have started talking and it would, wouldn't have made sense. Um, okay, so uh, let's jump on the next question. Um, I saw something interesting about um, trusting your your tests. So let me just dig out that question one moment. Yeah, this is from Douglas. Um, how do you learn to trust your test automation? How do you know that your passing tests really mean you are good to ship? All right, it's a good question, Douglas. Um, it, it's something that I, um, I wrote a short post. That actually, I don't think it's been published yet, but there is a snippet coming out soon um, in, in an article. I think it was for Sea Lights, I'm not sure, um, but I'll, I'll certainly be sharing it once it's done. Uh, and I talk about the illusion of green. Um, so, you know, it's funny in a lot of companies that if your build is red, there's like, you know, panic everywhere. Well, not necessarily panic, but someone's not happy somewhere and someone's been told, you know, get that red, you know, make that green immediately. You know, you're having, not having your lunch until you've done it. And, you know, and that, that is fine. You know, it's important because it means something's changed. And if something has changed, it means that we didn't foresee it and therefore it might be important information. So I always say when they go red, have a quick look just to see what it is. Uh, now with green, we tend to do the opposite and we just kind of, ah, oh, it's green, on we go. Um, you know, we don't, we don't really dig any deeper. And if you really wanna trust your automation, I know this is difficult in large code bases, but specifically in stuff that's you know, functional level. So things like API automation, some stuff on your UI or in your JavaScript. We should know exactly what they're doing. Um, we should know exactly the steps they're going through and why they exist. Uh, which means that we only have automated things that we fully know what they mean. So I like to think of, I, I have knowledge of the system and I've got that from testing. I've got that from exploring the application be it doing some exploratory testing, be it writing some automation and exploring the tool at that level, the product at that level, be it stuff about the product other people have told me. I have all this knowledge. And um, what I like to consider the automated checks to be doing is telling me if something in my knowledge has changed. So um, the automated checks have assertions in them, and I like to consider them to be codified or codified codified oracles even um, and they are basically snippets of my knowledge that I'm telling the computer if this ever changes I want you to tell me because all the stuff I speak about with my product and all the information I pass on is based on my knowledge model and I can't keep my knowledge model completely fresh because I can't test all day I can't be continuously checking everything so I have to use automation to help me um, so in terms of that trust, that's what it's about. It's about learning about the product, regularly reviewing your automation to make sure it is checking things that are important. You know exactly what they do. So when it is green, you have a better understanding of what they are. And the important bit is the regular reviewing. Um, if you haven't looked at all your automation recently, I encourage you to go into the office tomorrow and re-look over all your automation, all your checks that you've implemented. Uh, and find out exactly what they do. Delete the ones that you think are nonsense. And if you can't work out what it does, delete it. Um, if, yeah, and if, if you can't, why have I created this? Delete it. Uh, and really get to understand all of what those checks are doing. Um, because that is the whole point of it. It's about supporting the knowledge that you have. 
uh, and it's a continuous cycle. Learn something, if it's important enough, create an automated check and keep that cycle going. Uh, and that's how you can learn to really trust um, your automation. That's fantastic. I love what you shared there. Um, just put it on the chat, just to keep things light. Uh, someone called Dale. Um, is, is, <laughs> he's asked, has anyone asked a big question yet? <laughs> it was inevitable. Uh, <laughs> anyway, mo moving on. <laughs> no, let's answer it. Okay. So, you know, I'm a bit, a bit devastated. I, I went to get my hair cut yesterday, ready for this. And yeah, the barbers, he, he, took, he took quite a lot off. So I'm looking a bit, I'm looking a bit bald here right now. And it's a bit chilly, to be honest. Yeah, uh, but the good thing about beards is they grow back. So, hell yeah, it will it will be back <laughs> stronger. <laughs> I guess. And you... pineapple doesn't belong on a pizza. <laughs> nice. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So this is a question from Heather, and it is: Where do you start with making a case for better automation testability in an application? And she's provided an example, uh, adding IDs over using XPaths, for example. In terms of making a case, um, you know, testing isn't a silo. We're not, we're not a little function stuck on the end. Uh, we are one. We are part of the same team and we're trying, to do, we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to develop a product together to release it. So, you know, you have to respect the views of people in your team. And if they're coming to you, asking for some testability features, you know, you should respect them and you should, you know, have a conversation about why you want that. Um, you know, for example, adding IDs. If it's going to make your web driver more, your web driver scripts more reliable, um, then, you know, IDs on a whole tend not to do much damage. You know, they may add a few kilobytes to your page um, size, but, you know, it's, it's, it's negligible. negligible. Um, so, you know, you've got to be able to firstly justify your reasons, which is a back to being able to talk about automation. Uh, you've got to be able to make your argument very clear. Um, at the same time, though, you know, learn the skills to do it yourself as well. You know, there's, it, it, adding IDs, for example, isn't a difficult um, thing to do. Uh, you can also try and pair with them. If you're getting a bit of pushback, um, my advice, if, you're, if, you know, if there's some reluctance in the team, um, you know, firstly, that will be a bit of a toxic situation. You know, why, why don't you want to help each other? Um, but if you are getting pushback, proceed to go ahead and as I would just write my locators in something else. And then I would record, I would keep track over time, it, how often I'm having to change them um, because I don't have an ID and how much that time that's taking. And obviously then you end up to the important thing, which is money and some of these people, especially the higher up people, like to talk money. And if you can go to them and say, look, not adding IDs has cost me five hours of work in the last few months, that, you know, that's a substantial amount of money and time for any business. Um, but in really great performing teams, I would love to think now that you, know, you should be talking about testability right from the very off. So in that room, when you're discussing a new feature, you should be in your head thinking, well, the whole team should be thinking about what are we going to automate? Can we even automate that? And most of the time that comes from the question of, can I test this? And if you can't test it, you can't automate it. Hmm. So, and if you can't test it, then you're going to have difficulty getting the information you want in order to release the product in the first place. So, you know, most testability should stem from the need to have a human explore the product. And if we're struggling to explore the product, automations obviously is going to be incredibly hard. And now if you're in a company where you're not doing that, you're going to go and write you know, crazy complex automation just because you didn't have a conversation about testability. Um, so again, it's, testability is crucially important. and it, it falls back to the same model and skill, being able to understand and have the knowledge of your product and think about, can I do this? Uh, and then have that open discussion about testability. Great. Thanks for answering that. Great question from Heather there. So next one is from Matt. Thank you, Matt, for sharing this. Um, hi, Richard. Uh, I like that introduction. And not many people have said that. It's a nice touch. Um, how do you demonstrate the value of automation 
with quantifiable metrics. So I thought this is kind of relevant because you, you briefly touched on it in your previous answer about cost and time and all of that stuff. So, so yeah, over to you. It's a, it's an honest, uh, it's such an old question. I saw Michael Bolton uh, come up in the chat. He's, he's written endless stuff about this kind of thing and, the first thing I always think about now, and perhaps it's because I've been primed somewhat, is, you know, a lot of people talk about ROI when it comes to automation. And you very rarely have conversations about ROI on testing. So why are we having conversation about a snippet or a part of what is our approach to testing? Um, it does seem a bit odd. Um, but in terms of metrics, I don't, I don't really have an answer. Um, it's a tough one because, as I said, it's not, it's not automation and testing. It, it, you are just testing and you're using the automation to help you. So if you're able to get to a decision quicker, where as a team you believe this product is shippable, and that's partly down to your automation, it's partly down to some of the development practices that you have, and then it'll be partly down to some of the testing that's been done by anybody or you know it doesn't matter who's done it whoever's done that if you're getting to those decisions quickly and you can get it out the door you know you could potentially measure that and say you know well we're we're, we're being able to ship quite quickly and we're not having many issues in live um you could look at how many times your automation finds bugs but one well, that's not true um your automation will never find any bugs but it could be the case where your automation how many times it's fail you know that your checks are failing and when you go in and explore as a human you find out that it is actually a bug with um, your product you know you could look at that and say well the automation's actually detected 20 changes in the last month and they were all bugs um but that's difficult as well to to automate because if you're going to check every failure a lot of them will be down to your framework and um, because i got a little talk on youtube that you know, when I like, use my hands, for example, when you automated your check, it looked like this, you know, your product looked like this. So you made your check look like this, but now you've done some development work. Your, your product now looks like this. So therefore your checks don't cover anymore and bits change. So, you know, we, ha we have to go in and we, we look at it. So, you know, there's a few things it's, does it, is it detecting change that is important is something you can certainly measure. Um, but at the same time, if you're being asked these questions about automation, you should think about them as, um, uh, as testing as a whole and I've just seen someone think about manual time to automated time it, that again it's a nonsensical comparison um, because as a human running a test you actually will run significantly more tests than your automation will do it will only ever do the one thing you've told it to do um, so you, you know you could argue that that is a comparison um, but you're not getting the same level of co uh, coverage uh, when you think about the when you compared to a human doing it. But as I said, if you've got, you, what, a, what Aidan's just said in the chat there, if you've got automation that's just a perfect, you know, the ones you know, you know exactly what they do, they're helping with your knowledge, then you could justify and say, this is helping me deliver. But I would now prefer to categorize that as, if, I, if we can quickly say, yes, that's releasable, the quicker we can make that decision as a team, automation's played a part in that. But so is everything else. So I don't know if I answered his question, but I think you shared a lot of great information there that was, that was very relevant to the question. So thank you. Okay, let's move on. How are you doing, by the way? You know, we're, we're 40 minutes in. And, uh, yeah, I know. It's, it's getting tough, isn't it? It's, <laughs> uh, it's a lot of pressure, this. <laughs> well, I, I think you're doing great. And, and I, I can speak on behalf of the audience that they are loving what you are sharing um there's some incredible learnings you're sharing and, and you're absolutely inspiring everyone out there right now so so let's crack on we got another 20 minutes to go <laughs> okay so okay i'm just gonna uh jump on the next question i think i saw a, a good question from uh rosie hamilton so yep. thank you for sharing rosie um so the current project has unit tests but no integration tests. There's no time to write them as the business is pushing hard for delivery. 
Should the team be concerned or worried about the lack of integration tests? If needed, how do you convince the business to let the team spend time creating them? Um, hey, Rosie. Uh, so the first thing I think of is all those funny GIFs that you see on Twitter. I don't know if you've seen any of them with like, there's one where there's two window do windows and they, they open on their own. But as soon as you try and open both, it doesn't work. And They're amazing. there's a really good one. Yeah, there's a really good one with the hand dryer. Whereas um, if you use a towel and you put it in the bin, it puts the dryer on, which blows the towels everywhere. So, you know, it's the, these things as individual parts working is important. Um, you know, so obviously we want to know those individual things work as a whole, but no software is used as individual parts. So the product that the users are getting and they're paying for isn't, they're not using that single unit. They're using, you know, hundreds of them stuck together. So, you know, you could actually argue that the integration ones would be more important because none of those things are standalone. They are all part of the big system. Uh, in terms of, excuse me, in terms of the um, trying to push for it, again, it's back to being able to talk about testing, I guess. You know, you need to be able to coherently talk about risk. So, you know, the, the, there must be a reason why Rosie's got to that question. Um, something must have happened that potentially someone's uh, reversed the problem, let's say, and realized that, well, if we'd had an integration test at this point, um, we, we, we would at least been notified about it. Um, so, you know, again, you need to talk, be able to talk testing and say, look, this is really going to support me in this uh, effort that I'm trying to do. Uh, and apart from that, again, it's, it's down to an overall strategy to testing. You know, it's, 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 not, it's, it's, it's not a team's job anymore. It's the whole company has to be, you know, the whole, especially the project team at least, has to be focused on some testing aspect. And we should be viewed as the testing expertise because we are. And if we're making a stance or a claim and we can reasonably talk about it, we can justify it, you know, you'd want that team to listen to you. And, you know, I would actually be concerned if I was on that team and I wasn't being listened to. Um, so, you know, you have to make that stance. You can model it, model it visualize it, you know, some way if they want to see it in that form. Um, perhaps you could take some of your existing manual tests, which I'm guessing you have. I really dislike the word manual, but you have some, you know, current scenarios that you're running through. And um, perhaps you can break them, some of them down into what could be one to many integration um, you know checks and say look I'm running this every time we have a release it's taking me this amount of time if we had some coverage down at this level it would really help me do my job and I could spend more time potentially doing deeper exploration or pairing with the developers and um, to, to eliminate some of these issues in the first place um, so yeah that's that's pretty much all I can think of for that really that's great a lot of good stuff there Okay, let's jump on the next question. So this one you know, reading, uh, possibly possibly given an example earlier on, but let's let's dive into a bit more. So this is a, a question from Alistair. So thank you, Alistair, for sharing this. Um, what is the best example of a tool to aid in software delivery? created by an automation engineer that you have come across? Can you repeat it? The, the best tool I've come across, did he say? The best example of a tool to aid in software delivery created by an automation engineer that you've come across. And uh, feel free to big up one of your own if you can't think of someone else's. <laughs> um. Well, you know, the, the biggest one by far was obviously Selenium, its original one. Jason Huggins was um, doing some testing. That's what he was trying to do. And he said to himself, this has to be easier. And that's where Selenium came from. And then you had Simon Stewart who had the same thing. He was like, well, it has to be a better approach than Selenium. So he built WebDriver and then obviously the two got married and they live happily ever after. Um, but, you know, that is one. But I think on top of that, uh, a guy called Cheesy, uh, Cheesy, I only can't think of his full name now, Chesie Morgan, um, 
he created some Ruby gems which help people write page objects and I've never heard anyone complain about them. I've only ever seen people praise them. Oh, Jeff, that's his name. Cheers, Michael. <laughs> uh, I just call him Cheesy. I've called him that ever since I know him. Um, but he he written several root li uh, libraries in Ruby um, that have been used by many, many people. Uh, and then obviously you could take the one I mentioned earlier from uh, Dave Hefner, the internet. Uh, I've seen people use that on endless training courses related to the topic. Um, so, you know, those are probably um, some of the immediate things I can think of. Cool. So I'm just going to grab another question. At least I got his surname right. <laughs> well, uh, I wonder if he's listening right now. <laughs> Cur cursing, <laughs> maybe cursing you. I can't believe you got my name wrong. Um, okay, uh, I think this is a fantastic question. Um, this is from Amateur. Um, apologies if I've not pronounced your name correctly, but thank you for sharing this. The question is, what is your position on developers writing functional automated tests in order to consider their tickets done with or without QA guidance? Um, the QA guidance, oof. oh look, I've just, <laughs> I've just been brought some help. Someone's just delivered me delivered me a beer. Um, so oh, that's awesome. Uh, I'll cheers to that. <laughs> <laughs> so let me uh, let me think about it. So, person. So let's start with the first part of his question. Oh, her question. Sorry. Um, what was the name? Amit. Amir. One moment. I've just lost the view there. So my apologies. Oh, it's all right. So the first part that's important is. Uh, I think it's perfectly uh, acceptable for developers to write automated checks. Um, and in the best companies I've been in recent years, that has the, been the process that's been in place. However, in both those times, it wasn't with, uh, it was with guidance. And I think that is back to what we spoke about earlier. So they, we have a lot of automators, automators out there now, as I said, that have the ability to write lots of automation uh, and they're semi-good programmers. Um, now, they don't have the testing know-how and it can be the same for some of the developers. Now, I'm not gonna put everyone in the same hat. Some developers um, obviously are fantastic testers and developers actually do significant amounts of testing uh, that people, they, they will never claim to be doing it, but they do. Um, now, with the guidance, I think you can get yourselves into a fantastic position. So the fantastic company I was at um, was actually called Ascender, because let's name them because they do fantastic work. Um, we would have pre-planning meetings where we would get up the feature. We would talk about the feature until the point where we were all happy and fully understood it. The developers would then put GitHub on the screen and go through all the code that would need to be looked at and changed. And, and while they were doing that, I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm having a look myself. You know, obviously, once you've got played with code a bit, you start to see similar patterns. And then we would start to get a feel for the effort involved. But also, if we were changing things that were utilized a lot. And we could then, in that session, actually come up with a list of automated scenarios that we would, well, scenarios we would like to automate. Uh, now, we did that as a team. Obviously, I had a big influence in that because I'm the one with this testing expertise. But as soon as we've agreed that they would be good automated checks to build. Now we're joking about testability earlier. Now, if you ask a developer to write some automated checks and it's proven difficult, you can 100% guarantee they're gonna add some testability. Now they ain't gonna make their, their own life harder. They're gonna make that, they're gonna put as much testability in there. You've never seen anything like it. Um, now, what that means is you've agreed that there should be some checks in place. They've been written at the time of delivery uh, and then what you get is, um, again, to reference Michael, what you get delivered, you get delivered something that can work. It doesn't mean that it does work, but you're getting something that can work in the exact scenario that the developer wrote that check-in, which should be the one that you designed in the planning meeting. 
you're now getting something that can work. Now, I don't know how many times, I've probably lost count of how many times I've been told there's a new build somewhere, be it an app, be it a website, be it a product, and you go to install it or look at it and it's down or it's corrupt or you can't install it. Or there's a new feature and they've said, yeah, the new feature's on staging, you log on to staging and it's not there. If they've written an automated check and you've got, C, you've got continuous integration in place, you know it's there. Otherwise, the radiator would be red. So I'm much happier in a company and a team where I'm being delivered something that can work. So I'm a huge fan of it. Without guidance, I've never experienced. Um, I'm quite a, you know, I'd like to share my expertise. So I can't imagine myself being in a team and not having a say at some point, even if it was just a nod of acceptance. Um, I can't imagine that ever being the case. But as I said, some developers have great testing skill sets so there's nothing stopping them from doing it but as a skilled tester i would rather spend my time digging deep into an application and exploring it as deep as i can go thinking about other aspects instead of writing lots of automated checks i like writing automated checks but you know i like to balance my time doing different things in the testing space so again emphasize something we said earlier once you've identified that it should be created it doesn't matter who creates it as long as it is created Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So we got just under nine minutes left of this uh, testing ask me anything. So let's, uh, let's dig a bit deeper and uh, let's find some more questions for you. Whew. Fifty minutes has gone pretty quick, actually. Uh, I don't know what it's like for people watching, but it's gone pretty quick for me. Amazing. Or people listening for that matter. That's great. Okay, so um, you've touched on this briefly, but I think I think we can explore this a bit more. So um, this is a question from Jithin Matthew. So thank you for this question. How to manage test data effectively in test automation? So perhaps I'll rephrase it. How, how might we manage test data effectively in test automation? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's a great question. As you said, we've hit on bits of it. Um, so for me, the test data is, um, the test data is a very small part of the overall uh, idea of managing the state. So in order to be able to reliably run a check, you need to control the state. And test data is a very large part of that. Uh, I'm a big fan of the data builder pattern. Um, I've got a YouTube video on the whiteboard testing explaining data builder pattern and a couple of blog posts as well. Uh, the idea behind the data builder pattern is um, we model a user. So let's take, keep it simple. A user has a username and a password and we model that and we know that our automated check needs one. So the first thing we do is we write some code to look in our database and say, do you have a user, just any user? And if they say yes, then we send the user back to the test and then the test uses uh, that user. Now, if we don't have a user or we don't have any data that meets the criteria, let's say just to make it a bit more explicit, um, we then have code that goes and creates that user. And then it will put the user in the database and then we pass that user back to our automation and then it can use it in its scenario. Um, there's many advantages to this. Um, the first one is your database now gets big over time, um, which is great because what a lot of people, one approach a lot of people have is to start with a basic, um, not basic, sorry, they, they, um, uh, they install a, a database image. So they take the, they kill the database and they put in an image that has all the data they need. Now, none of your live systems have data in that way. So if you're going down that approach, like sure, you'll be able to look at your functionality, but you are potentially covering up some bugs that may be there with a large data set, such as slow loading, queries taking some long timeout issues. Um, so when you add the data builder pattern, you're continuously adding. And some of the feedback I get is that people say, oh, but you'll end up with loads of data. Uh, but you don't. Because a lot of checks leave data in a specific state, which would then be picked up later on by another check. As it queries to say, do I have an account in this state? It will go, yeah, I do. Here you go. 
and you use it. Um, so that's how I approach managing data. I'm a big, I said, big fan of the data builder pattern, and also I prefer it to be tied to the check itself. So I don't want to preload lots of data. I don't want to pre-install an image that's perfect for these scenarios. I want it to be a self-contained check that controls its state, adds its data, runs its algorithm, does its assertions, and then tidies up at the end if it needs to. Uh, or it could just leave it there and carry on. But it's a great question, and it's one that a lot of people don't get right. And that leads to flaky and brittle automation, which is what no one wants. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, OK, so uh, just some lovely feedback there from TJ. Thank you. Richard is awesome. I'm so glad he held this session. Absolutely agree with that. I saw something about another 30 minutes, you know, let, let, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> yeah. I turn into a pumpkin at nine o'clock, so I must be, I've got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So I'm just uh, going down the ask a question section. It's a little slow on the scroll. So, uh, so while, while Simon finds the next question, um, I am going to answer every single question. Um, if the ones we don't get to today, I will answer them on um, either on uh, Crowdcast itself or I'll copy the question over to the Ministry of Testing Club uh, and I'll post a thread for each question and answer it there as well and allow other people in the community to, to help out where they can. And I guess, uh, Richard, is it worth mentioning to those people who aren't familiar with the club, I've just posted a link to it, uh, what the club's about and why people should go on it. Uh, yeah, sure. The club is the replacement forum for what was the Software Testing Club. So it's just a great place full of people uh, who really care about testing. You can post questions, get answers. It's nice and shiny now. It's new. It's modern. You can add all sorts of attachments and do all sorts of wonderful stuff. But it's just a great place to ask any specific questions and get help that you want. So, you know, I do encourage you to join it. Uh, and that's where I'll be answering those questions I haven't got around to. But anyway, let's try and squeeze a few more in before... Uh, before you turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Ah, here we go. Um, a question from Maret, and it is this. Uh, oh. Would you have tips on how to go about automating in Windows applications that aren't web? Yeah, sure. Um, again, this is on my, one of my list of tools that I just got from Twitter of people tweeting a lot. Um, so Microsoft have... I don't know what's happened to them, but you know they're suddenly now nice and happy and friendly and releasing everything left, right, and center open source. And one of the things they've released is the we're, we're Windows App Driver. Um, so the Windows App Driver came out of implementing um, uh, the, the, the W3C standard for WebDriver, but in turn, because a lot of the way Windows apps are built now, they've done, they followed exactly the same um, API design but it now works on Windows desktop. So my place would, to start with would be Windows App Driver. It's on GitHub. It's free to, uh, obviously, it's free to use. Uh, there was an old tool that used to be called White, um, W-H-I-T-E. It's not been maintained very well recently, but I believe it still works. Uh, however, said that, um, I'm not one to talk about commercial tools, but I, got a, <laughs> I was at Eurostar a while ago, and uh, they... There was a big banner for this codeless automation. And I looked at this tool. It's called Leap Test. Um, it does actually have a very fascinating approach to um, automation. It uses image comparisons. And it sounds awful, but it's actually quite speedy. Um, so basically, you can automate absolutely anything with it. So that is just another one to check out. But I would personally start with the Windows app driver, because if Microsoft are looking after it and it's on Windows, then you've got a very good chance that it will work. Absolutely. OK, I think we got. We got time to sneak in one more question. So uh, this is from Heather Harleman Manis. So thank you, Heather, for for getting in the final question. So here it is: Are there areas where automation isn't a good choice? Isn't a good choice. Um... <sighs> I, automation, as I define it, as being a tool that supports you, then of course not. You know, we, we, we're never not using tools. Um, so, you know, there is always that case. Now, in terms of writing automated checks, if that's what they may mean, then there is certain spaces that just 
don't suit well, don't fit well. Excuse me, sorry. Um, the mobile space is still a very interesting, fluctuating space, and that is an area where I would automate cautiously. So the tools are now much better than they were a few years ago, and I would again, I encourage you to try. But it is certainly an avenue that is still a bit brittle. Um, you know, there is tools, for example, Appium and XCUI and Expresso. Uh, they do work, but you are going to run into an issue. And it's funny what the issue is. If you think about WebDriver as a, as, a, as a comparison, it's nearly 10 years old or nine years old. And it's taken it probably six, seven, eight years to become stable. And it's not WebDriver that became stable. It's the browsers. If you look at browsers now, they've kind of reached a bit of a plateau where, you know, the new features aren't all big anymore. Like on Chrome, a lot of the work is, you know, on the developer tools and things like that. Uh, and it's because they're in a stable place now. And mobile is just not quite there yet. I think iOS is 10, 11 years old. Uh, and we're just not quite there with the testing aspect. Apple only really cared about four or five years ago. And that's why that area is not good. But at the end of the day, as I said, it's not a question of should we or not, should we or should we or should we not use automation. Um, it's back to the, the problem is always a testing problem. So if we fully understand the testing problem, we should utilize whatever tools we have to help us solve that problem, and help us continuously solve that problem in the future. Um, so again, never say no. Always willing to try, but never make automation your first point of call. Start with the testing problem, understand it and utilize whatever skills you have um, and try and solve that problem. That's wonderful. And I think that's a, an absolutely fantastic way to close this evening's session. Um, so, yeah, well, on behalf of the audience, Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you uh, to everyone who shared your questions and, and apologies that we weren't able to get through all of them. But as Richard mentioned, he will um, best efforts, get those questions uh, answered, um, either on Crowdcast or over at the, the club. Uh, and, you know, let's, let's keep the conversation going. And um, I absolutely believe this has sparked tons of uh, ideas for people out there. So, so again, Richard, thank you so much for your time and for sharing what you shared today. It's uh, utterly incredible. And as we mentioned earlier on, this, this video will be available. So you can watch it back again if you miss some stuff or uh, welcome if uh, this is you watching the replay. <laughs> Should have said that at the start. <laughs> um, and if there's anything that you've discovered this evening that, that is exciting and that you feel others should, uh, should hear about it, then get yourself on the forum and also get, you know, get tweeting the hashtag, uh, hash, hashtag testing AMA. Get the information out there. Go and inspire others. Don't just keep it to yourself. Go, go and share with people. Start conversations, and you know, let's let's move our craft forward. This is what this is about. Um, so that's us for now, Richard. Um, oh, do you have yeah. anything else to share before I uh, end end the session? Yeah, I do. So obviously, thank you all for attending. Um, as Simon said at the start, this was an experiment. Um, the Ministry of Testing, we. You know, I'm the speaker today because I felt I have had good things to share, but this was an experiment and we tried to keep it lean and simple. So if you have any feedback on this format, again, please post that in the chat. Please tell us what you think. If you, if you like the format and there's another topic you want to see in the future or ha perhaps a, spe uh, a specific speaker, um, please tell us um, because we want to know if this is something that's provided value uh, and if this is a format that we should continue with. Um, because, you know, we only have limited resources, so we want to invest our energies and efforts in things that you really like and appreciate and get value from. Um, so please do tell us if you like the format. Uh, and from me personally, I love talking about this stuff. And, um, you know, I, I, I find it a fascinating journey to go on when I, I try and share some of the stuff that I've experienced and I'm aware of. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoy doing it. And I appreciate you all for coming along to, to listen to me today. And and thank you, Simon, for agreeing to host the first one uh, and supporting what, what, what we're up to here. Hey, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for asking. Uh, it's, it's been awesome. It's been good fun. And uh, yeah, that I guess that's, that's us for now. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again next time. Um, we'll see you soon and uh, keep exploring. Yeah, 
Awesome. Bye, Bye everyone.